गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग हाउ इज एवरी वन डूइंग God for everything that you have done for us. Help us to remember everything that you have done for us because sometimes we are very forgetful. Help us to live every day and do everything in the honor of you to bring to glorify you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Just before I start the message, I just want to, if you're new with us or if you haven't been to church for a while, I just wanted to point out this, this um, picture on the wall. Um, some of you might be wondering what that is. And um, yeah, so, so those little rectangles represent bricks. And that picture is a picture of our future youth pastor. And so what we've been asking people, we're, we're, we're raising 
money to, to call a youth pastor. And so what we're asking people to do is, is take a brick and uh, you should be able to put it on your fridge at home. And in doing so, if you take one of those bricks, you're committing to an extra $5.50 a week in your tithe. So there's about half missing there that gone. And so we're bit by bit each week, some more of those rectangles go, more of those bricks go. And, and uh, you know, when you take one of those things, you're building into the life, you're investing in our youth. So we really appreciate those who have already taken one. I pray that you'll pray- prayerfully um, consider how, how you can give as well. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just come before you right now. We, we would ask that you would speak into our lives with God's truth, with your truth. And uh, Lord, uh, not only will we hear, but we will respond in kind. We'd say, Lord, here am I, send me. So we're in our Absolute Surrender series. And uh, today we've been looking at um, uh, surrendering our self-righteousness. Um, I know this is, a, this is a big, big thing. And um, for some of you, you might, you might be saying, well, what does it mean to be self-righteous? What does that look like? And um, fortunately, Jesus has given us some great pictures from the Gospels on what self-righteousness looks like. And so uh, he told one story, and before he told this story, he said these words. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down by everyone else, everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Those who were confident in their own self-righteousness. Jesus told this parable for this purpose. So this is a picture of what self-righteousness looks like. And so in this parable, there's two people who come to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, one is a tax collector. And the Pharisee, he stands up in front of everybody, makes sure everybody sees him, and he says these words, he prays these words, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers or even like this tax collector i fast twice a week and give a tenth of all i get so the pharisee's standing up there for everyone to see he's grandstanding and he's puffed up with his own self-righteousness and he says look at me god look at how good i am I'm not like those evildoers, I'm not a robber, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not like that tax collector. You must be pleased with me. And then he starts to talk about his religious works. He says, well, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything that I have. Surely you must love this God. Surely this will make me right with you. You see the self-righteousness? It's all about me. It's all about what I earn. It's all about what I do. It's about building up my religious credentials. It's about building up my religious works in order to be right with God. Then the tax collector. He gets up. He doesn't look up to heaven. He looks down and he beats his chest. He says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He came with arms empty. He knew who he was and he humbled himself before the Lord and said, I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said only one person went away right before God. And it wasn't the Pharisee, it was the tax collector. It's a great picture of self-righteousness. The other picture that I was struck was, was the, the, the story of the, the, the prodigal son. You know how it goes. You know, this guy takes his fortune, leaves his father, turns his back on his dad, heads to other countries where he spends all his wealth. 
where he spends it on war, living, and, and he's, he's used it all up. There's a famine in the land. He's, he's in abject poverty. And he makes up his mind to go home to dad. If he's not going to have me back as a son, I'll, I'll plead to be his servant. So he makes his way back to dad and... And his father runs out to greet him. You know the story. He says, put the robe on my son. He's returned. Put the ring on his finger. Hurry. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. My son who was dead is now alive. Then we have the older brother. The older brother goes, you've got to be kidding I am so angry right now. I've spent all my life slaving for you. And you never once killed a fatted calf for me. And now this, this son of yours, who's a good for nothing, comes back and you welcome him. What gives? The father said, son, all I have is yours. But this boy of mine's come back, he's alive. The older son was acting out of performance. He thought his approval with his father was dependent on what he did. He thought he had to earn his father's approval. And then we have the, the other son who, <laughs> according to the older brothers, are good for nothing. The father acted in grace. The father was gracious, not because of what either of those guys done, but because he loved them. They didn't have to earn. They just had to be his sons. Beautiful pictures and that, that, that brother, that older brother is a, a picture of this, this puffed up self-righteousness. It's all about me. It's all about what I do. The Apostle Paul was, uh, was a, a heavyweight champion of, of legalistic righteousness, of self-righteousness. And when he became a Christian, he had to, to deal with people who are self-righteous and legalistic. It's in Philippians 3, if you want to turn your Bibles there, we're going to be looking at this passage and, and uh, it says in verse 1, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Paul's gospel was simple. It is by grace we are saved. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. We humbly receive it through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the simplicity of the gospel that Paul preached. But there was a group of men and, and perhaps women, I don't know, who went around following Paul on his missionary journeys or turned up at Paul's rallies or whatever and they were opposing that message. Their message was the opposite to Paul's. In order to be right with God, you have to earn it. You have to do that through keeping the law, absolute blind obedience to the law. And the other thing that Paul preached was the gospel was available to all. Doesn't matter what nationality, doesn't matter what people group, doesn't matter who you are, the gospel, you can receive it. These guys were saying you have to be a Jew. Salvation is for Jews only. And if you're not a Jew and you want to become a Jew and be right with God, you have to be circumcised. You have to become a Jew. 
And so we have these two opposing uh, 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 um, messages. One from Paul, that came from God, the truth, and these guys were the total opposite. These guys were salvation by grace. These were salvation by works. And, and Paul was opposed at every point by these people. And Paul, well, he, he was pretty blunt about these guys, wasn't he? He called them dogs. He called them mutilators of the flesh. He's calling them uh, uh, evil people, people who do evil. And he said, you know what? These guys, their circumcision's only external. The circumcision that God's looking for is circumcision of the heart. He says, we're the true circumcision, the ones who have faith in Jesus Christ. We who worship by the Spirit of God. We don't have to have rituals. We don't have to have legalism. We don't have to have hoops that we jump through. We worship by the Spirit of God in spirit and in truth. We can worship him anywhere. The true circumcision of people who glory in Christ Jesus. We don't glory in our works. We don't glory in our flesh. We glory in Jesus. We boast about him. And we're the ones who put no confidence in the flesh because the flesh fails. The flesh lets us down. Paul goes on to say, if you want religious credentials, I've got them. If you, you know, you, you circumcision group, you mutilators of the fish, you, you know, you think you're really good being legalistic and all your self-righteousness will tell me, I beat you all, I topped you all, I was the, the heavyweight wrestling champion of legalism and self-righteousness. He goes on to talk about it. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, poor, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Paul was saying, look at my religious pedigree that, that I once treasured. Circumcised on the eighth day, I am a true Jew. I was born a Jew and circumcised on the eighth day. I didn't just become a Jew, I was born a Jew. I'm an Israelite, I'm, the, I'm of the people of God. The ones who got entered into this special covenant relationship and gave the law at Mount Sinai, I'm part of that nation, I'm part of that people, I am an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm part of this elite group of people who belong to this, this tribe. Not just any tribe, but the tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel was a Benjaminite, Saul. Perhaps he was named after King Saul. The, 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 when the, the kingdom was, was broken in two after the reign of Solomon, the southern kingdom was made up of, of uh, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, where Jerusalem was there as well. This was no ordinary tribe. This was an elite tribe in Israel. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was born in Tarsus and uh, he ob obviously, you know, he would have adopted some of the culture of that city. He might have even spoke the language of that city which was most likely Greek. But what he's saying is, I kept the language I worked hard at keeping the Hebrew language. I never let go of who I was, this Jewishness. In regard to the law, a Pharisee, I am one who used to turn myself inside out, keeping the law. I was zealous for the law. For zeal, well, I used to persecute the church. I was there at the stoning of Stephen. I was on my way on the road to Damascus when I met Jesus. I was going to put these Christians in prison. As for legalistic righteousness, you couldn't have found a, a, a more diligent and zealous person to be absolutely right before God. 
Isn't this the religion of the day? Don't we still do this? Don't we still live in that self-righteous place? I've done plenty of funerals in my time of Australians and you know the big thing is they'll stand up there and they'll point to the coffin and say, there lies a good man or there lies a good woman. This person lived a really good life, you know, had kids, uh, didn't do anything wrong, didn't steal, didn't murder, they gave to charities, I mean, they really lived a good life. Our religion in Australia is what we have to earn to get to heaven. We are the ones who have to earn it. And you know, we do that in the church. Sometimes we hop in and out of legalism. Sometimes we hop in and out of our own self-righteousness. We do that naturally, don't we? Just thinking about that myself, think about Paul when he, he, he listed all these, these religious pedigrees and all his works. I could do the same. Brought up in a Baptist church, went to Sunday school, went to Christian Endeavour, went to church all on the same day, then went to church in the evening. Did the Christian Endeavour exams. I, uh, I grew up in youth group. Um, I was a boys' brigader. I was baptised as a teenager. Taught RE, taught Sunday school. Went to Bible college, attained my degree in ministry. Then got a graduate diploma in ministry. I was ordained in 2003. 22 years have passed. Five of those years was a regional consultant with Queensland Baptist looking after 30 churches in the north. I have reason to brag. I have reason to put on my religious credentials and tick off all the boxes and say, God, aren't you pleased with me? But there came a time in my life when I recognise that none of that stuff matters. I realised that I was a sinner and I could do nothing about it and I needed a saviour. And his name was Jesus. All of those religious works I just mentioned, hey, they're good. God called me to do these things, but none of that gets me into heaven. None of that makes me right with God. And it just seems to me in the church, we need to learn this lesson over and over and over again. We need to take off this mask of self-righteousness and throw it away forever. Because I tell you what it does, does it's, it's, it's a faith killer. And it ruins our relationship with one another. It doesn't get you closer to God, it takes you further from God. Because we're saying, I can do it all on my own. It's all up to me. I don't need God and his grace. Paul had this defining moment in his life. There's one point in his life where everything changed. Listen to these words. But whatever was to my profit, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So what we see here is the, the Apostle Paul having this paradigm shift, this, this point of meeting Jesus, and when he met Jesus, he knew that all of that stuff that he put his hope in, all of those works, all of those religious pedigrees, all of those credentials amounted to zip. 
he said it was all loss and he actually looked at that stuff and he said it's refuge it's dung it doesn't make me right with god What he's saying here is that all my life I've been struggling, all my life I've been turning myself inside out, back to front, and and you know what? I continue to go on that performance treadmill. I worked so hard. I was so good at keeping the law. I did all these things. I spent hours on it, days on it, all the time on it. But it didn't satisfy the deepest longing of my soul. It left me empty. It left me short. But then came Jesus. Everything is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He is now the goal of my life. He is now the song of my life. He is now the most important thing in my life and and he is my saviour. Not what I did before. And so he's got a new goal in life. He says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead, from the dead. This is Paul's goal from here on in. This is what he longs for. This is what he's he's, he's, uh, uh, trusting God for. He says, I want to know Christ. Is that your goal too? I want to know Christ. Paul knew Christ, he met him the day that he, 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 he appeared before him at the Damascus Road. Paul knew him, but this is years later and he's still saying, I want to know Christ. He's not saying, I want to know about Christ, I want more information about Jesus. He's saying, I want to know him. I want to, to, to deepen that relationship with him. It's a bit like when I first married Sue. We, we, we knew each other. We had a knowledge of each other, we had a relationship together, but, but I can stand 700 years later now and I can say back then we really didn't know each other. But through life, through all the good stuff, through the bad stuff, through having children, having grandchildren, you grow to know, you grow in that relationship, you grow in that intimacy. That's what Paul's saying here. I want to know Christ. I want to deepen that relationship because he is everything to me now. Is that your prayer? Is that your longing? What a goal. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The resurrection happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus, Jesus rose from the grave. He strode out of that tomb. And that has impact for us today. The risen Lord Jesus is here by his spirit. He's living in each one of us who are in Christ. That is the truth. The risen Lord Jesus is living in us and his promise is, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Whether we're at home, whether we're at work, whether we're in church, whether we're out at play, Christ in you. And it's such an intimate union that that, that Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Or Christ our life. So connected are we that, that his life becomes ours. And he promises never to leave nor forsake. That is such a comfort, especially when we're going through the mess of life. But even something more. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. 
the power to change, the power to help us to live through whatever circumstances come our way. It's there in you. And when we struggle with sin, when we struggle with difficulties in life, our first response is, I've got to do something. I've got to take control. I've got to perform. And God is saying, no, I want you to trust me. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. It is the Spirit of Christ the Spirit of the Father, and that is a living, active, dynamic power that you can never have in your own strength. And so we seem to jump into that self-righteous mode and try to handle it all. I was reading a story the other day in a book, I can't remember the author's name, so I apologise, Mr. Author, but he was on a conference in the United States where 2,000 men were, And he preached on two of men's biggest problems. Anger and sexual lust. And by the end of that weekend, all 2,000 men were kneeling together and he'd, he'd been preaching about crying out to God. So many people in the Bible cried out to God when they were in trouble and, and, and he invited them to cry out. Lord, deliver me. Not complicated prayers, just simple prayers. He got a letter a couple of weeks ago from a guy who said, I've been addicted to pornography nearly all my life. He said, I picked up a magazine when I was just a young fella. And it's never left me. Doesn't matter what I've tried, doesn't matter what I do just doesn't work. I've, I've, I've been to the, to the moon and back trying to overcome this stuff. And that weekend, he knelt down and prayed that prayer, Lord, deliver me. He cried out to God. Um, he got, in that letter, he said to, to, the, to this guy, he said, you know, for two weeks, it was all the same. Things didn't change. But then he said, I just got so fed up, I just got so discouraged that I pulled my car over on the way home, way to work and, and I just cried out to God, Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. And he said, from that point on, he's never had problems. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know this resurrection power, not in the future. I want it now in my life. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Paul knew what it was like to suffer. He'd been to the moon and back with his suffering for Christ. He knew what it was like. And he's saying, you know what, when we go through those, those, those valleys, when we really hit those dips and we're really struggling, he said, you know, in the midst of all my suffering, in the midst of all my persecution, I can know sweet fellowship with Jesus because I identify with him. I'm carrying my cross, I'm walking after him, and there's this sweet fellowship. It's the same for each and every one of us. I've spoken to so many people in this church who have suffered from cancer or ill health or have been struggling with things and and one of the constant themes are, this is really terrible, but you know what? Christ has carried me. He's kept me. I've, I've enjoyed sweet fellowship. Then becoming like him in his death and so somehow attained to the resurrection from the dead when we're walking through life. I don't know how many years I've got left. <laughs> I'm getting really old. Doesn't matter, you know, how many days I've got. You know, Christ, his presence goes before us. His resurrection power goes before us. 
and he's changing us more and more like him. And one day, we will be complete. One day, we will be perfect, like Jesus. We will know what this resurrection looks like. We'll know how it changes us completely. It's a wonderful future for us. I was looking at the 12 steps the other day of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the three steps, these are in my words, not theirs, really speak into this whole thing about self-righteousness. In the Alcoholics Anonymous, 12 steps to recovery, the first thing is honesty. We need to admit our own powerlessness to change. Seems to me that's a Christian thing, isn't it? We need to admit the fact that in our own strength we cannot change. Second thing is accept that there is a higher power that can bring healing. We know that power, don't we? It's Jesus Christ. He can change us. And third thing is surrender. Surrender our self-righteous behaviour and with the help of this higher power, that is Jesus, there is recovery. I wonder if today you've been struggling with something in your life. Maybe there's a sin that you just keep failing in. Maybe there's a struggle that you have and that, that you've tried everything. You've, 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 you've just said, I'm going to be a better Christian next time. How about you stop striving and cry out to God? Draw on His power. Accept that He's there in your life. And surrender to our own desire to control things ourselves and abide in Christ. Maybe some here who really have lived the self-righteous life. You thought being a Christian was earning. You thought being a Christian was performing. This morning's an opportunity to surrender yourself to that thinking give it up put it away abide in Christ maybe some of you are saying I want to know Christ I want to know him intimately I want to know him deeper I'm not satisfied with where I am right now In each one of those situations, you can cry out to God. Ask Him to deliver. Ask Him to help in His mighty power. Let's put away our self-righteousness today and forevermore. Now let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much for what you have achieved for us at the cross. And Lord, even as Christians, sometimes our our autopilot is to go straight back to self-righteousness. Lord, today we want to surrender it to you. We want to abide in the vine. We want to trust completely in you. Make us aware, Lord, of, of, of the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Lord, deliver us from the things we struggle with and make us passionate for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you been struggling with anything? If you need prayer, just come and see one of our elders after the service or speak to somebody. Don't leave it here. Let's share our struggles. Let's share our sins. Let's share uh, the, just that we want to grow. We want to know Christ more. No, let's be the body of Christ. self-righteousness away away and surrender to our God. If you feel that you need prayers or need to
talk to someone, I would invite you to come and sit in the front seats as we sing this song together. Let's stand and sing. us not to let go of that hope. Help us not to give up and help us to remember that your grace is sufficient for us and that your power is made perfect in our weakness. Be our strength, God. Help us to not rely on our own self-righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.